I'm a Christian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. You ever wondered what survivors of a mass shooting were thinking about when they were trying to avoid being killed? Do you wonder if our online business models can survive hacking attacks from hostile governments? Now, as scary as these scenarios are, we must face the fact that this is the world we live in. We'll look at the problems and ways in which you can avoid them, but first, meet my co-host, Jim Falk. Jim, welcome back to the program. It's always good to be with you. You are the CEO, and I think last time I checked, and the president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Last I looked, I was. Good, let's hope you still are. <laughs> Sitting next to you over here is Israel Martinez. He's uh, certified in cyber counterterrorism and defense by the Department of Homeland Security. He's trained over 200 Fortune 500 directors and officers in enterprise cyber risk management. And he's met President Xi Jinping of China, which I think will be a very interesting story. I'm sure you and he had a long conversation. So I'm looking forward to that, Israel. Well, to the extent we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sitting next to you is Greg Schaefer. Spent 20 years with the FBI and today is founder and president of Schaefer Security Group, where he's a recognized expert in the prevention of domestic terrorism and active shooter events. He's the author of this book, which is Stay Safe, Security Secrets for Today's Dangerous World. And Greg, let me just begin by asking you why you wrote that book. Well, it's a good question. To be brutally honest, because I got sick and tired of seeing people die unnecessarily. In an active shooter event, one of the worst things you could do is hide, cower under your desk. And I just kept seeing these videos of school children videotaping themselves hiding underneath their desk, quote unquote, waiting for their turn to die. The number one best course of action you can do in an active shooter event is run, <laughs> move, get off the X, as we say in my world. Interesting. You just told me before the program that you had a sort of a little personal situation yesterday with a daughter, a granddaughter, I forget which it was. Tell us about that. It's funny because just yesterday my four-year-old granddaughter came home from preschool and told me about her active shooter drill they did that day. Yeah. So they're even t having to teach four-year-old preschoolers how to respond in the event of these tragic ac incidents. Well, I, that, to me, that, that is a tragic <clears throat> indictment of where we are in this world though, isn't it really? He really is. But keep in mind, too, when we were that age, we also did the put your head between your knees and sit on desk waiting thrill, for the big right? mushroom cloud to, to go right. off. So yeah, we did. it's just this generation's you know, Cold War, I guess. What did you tell her? Well, I made sure she was uh, being told to do the right thing, that they weren't hiding underneath the desk. They were hiding in the corner. And did she have anything in her hand to throw it to person should they come in the doorway? And she told me all the right answers. So the school that we chose for her, and we did do some our due diligence that they are teaching their children how to respond correctly. That's good to hear. That is good to hear. Now Israel, uh, you and I, obviously we've been on this program before, we were talking about uh, all kinds of cyber issues, blockchain issues, etc. And you spend a lot of your life in cybersecurity in corporate America, but there are also a lot of espionage things that you're involved in. And so I'm going to ask them to put that graphic up on the screen and just sort of talk us through this graphic and talk about the espionage side of this issue that we're talking about. Sure, Isn't it's interesting how the threat has evolved now where cyber and the human element are no longer independent. So on your left you'll see um, organizations that have, through public information, um, have been participating somewhere or another in terms of intentional or unintentional espionage. So in the case of Supermicro, for example, um, it was after the fact, um, at least we believe it was unintentional, that there were back doors and how they were servicing um, some of the firmware, right? And, and what happens is organizations like the Chinese will knowingly embed a back door in certain types of software, especially if, if it's at a firmware level, it's very difficult to detect, and it allows them to have visibility, right? So one of the things that I think is really important for us as a country to understand is that um, we often think in terms of cybersecurity, but we need to start thinking in terms of cyber warfare. Because, in my opinion, the war has already begun. 
in terms of um, how you traditionally define war. It's really imposing, you know, the will of one country uh, upon another, right, to the point where it's, it's actually hurting people or the economy in ways that are material. And certainly we've been experiencing that in terms of uh, the threat to critical infrastructure, number one, um, and number two, in terms of theft of intellectual property. So as you see in that chart, what happens is these companies come in, they look like they're doing legitimate business in the United States, and maybe that may be the shell's intent. And I can tell you right here in Dallas, Texas area, we have companies that are owned by um, the Chinese government. CTE, you want to try that one? Um, so, so without naming these, <laughs> that may be under active uh, <laughs> uh, um, espionage campaigns today, I will tell you that they come in, they're Chinese owned, they may even trade on the public stock exchange, right? And they have hundreds of U.S. companies that are their clients. And now they use, they may have a mail server, for example, that is in China, and the client doesn't know that. So now all communication is happening. And, you know, some would say by definition, that's a breach, right? Because all that communication in terms of the business analytics and whatever else they're talking about is happening directly with China. Um, and sometimes not like is uh, portrayed through Singapore or some hop. But the technical layer is so deep that the customer may not know it, right? And so what we're discovering now as we go through using latest technologies to understand how do these networks um, actually map uh, at the DNS level, the lowest level, and we see also that there's a human side to this whole thing, right? In terms of people on the inside, inside of threats that are, that are increasing the capability of the cyber intent to conduct the espionage. Uh, should I be scared about that as I am or no? It's an issue, yeah. It's, I mean, in fact, um, if, if you look at, uh, other than China, some other countries have extreme intent. So the type of malware that we're seeing in the networks now are designed to break things, to hurt people, and to uh, change data at its source. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you think about our banking industry, uh, our stock exchanges, those are built on trust, right? Trust that the information, whether it be a balance sheet or other things that are happening, inventory control, um, are accurate. And we now know the capability to change that data at its source um, exists in the hands of foreign nationals and the ability to access it and make something happen. So we need to prepare for what resiliency looks like in that environment. Well, um, on a previous program, we had one of your cohorts, the head, actually the special agent in charge of Dallas now, Matt DeSarno, and, and he and I talked off camera about making sure that we think about China in terms of the Chinese government and the Communist Party, not necessarily all the Chinese um, people, Absolutely. but all the state-owned enterprises are still a huge part of that, and, and a lot of these companies are state-owned enterprises. You had the opportunity to interview an old friend of yours, Jim I did. Olson. Jim Tell Olson. Us about that. And I we'll suspect you may know Jim Olson. Mm -hmm. Jim Olson was, uh, was chief of station <coughs> in Vienna and also head of counterintelligence at the agency. Now he's over at Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, when I asked him about threats, he talked about China and specifically about how effective China is in using some of our social media for recruitment. Let's listen to what Jim had to say. If you're being recruited for any kind of a job, you need to know who the recruiter is, what nationality they are, and you need to be very, very skeptical if it's a country like China. Because the China, I guarantee you, are out there to use the employment angle to bring people in and then gently move them into espionage. It starts out simple, it starts out benign, starts out innocent, but before long they've rolled you, reeled you in and you are engaged in, in giving water. up, giving, you're in deep water, you've given up a lot more information than you intended to, but you've gotten used to the money. And you know, it, it seems to me that this shows and really underscores the importance of the government working with the private sector. Mm -hmm. And again, Jim Olson really gives quite a warning about the role and perhaps the caution that some of the media companies and social media like LinkedIn need to, need to pay attention to. Let's listen to that. Okay. I think all those uh, media companies need to be alert to the fact that they're being used, they're being manipulated. LinkedIn is an example. The others are also uh, subject to that kind of victimization by, by the Chinese. The Chinese use any tool available to them. 
They're very subtle, they're very sophisticated, they're very smart, and they are constantly trolling. And the, the media, the uh, websites like that are a good place for them to find Americans who might be lured into some kind of information sharing, some kind of profit-making scheme. So how do you see the responsibility of companies? What should be their reaction? Well, I think the first uh, step we as citizens need to make sure we are holding our legislators accountable in terms of policy, right? Because there's not clear policy in many areas in terms of, so the Chinese may have a U.S. operation, they're legitimately allowed to operate here, but the intent of what they're doing, the information, is, is where the espionage steps in, right? So we as a country need to carefully look at that. And I, I like what you said, Dennis, I mean, this is not about all Chinese being bad people, but certainly we know that the communist ownership of the country and these corporations have a different type of intent in terms of how they're accessing information and how they may be willing to manipulate society in certain ways. So I, I think that that's one aspect. The second aspect is, as citizens, we need to protect our minds, right? Why go to war if a country can impose its will in terms of changing the minds of the population through Facebook or Google or other means in a way that benefits them, right? And so I think that's a really important aspect we have as a, a, a responsible citizens to start thinking about how we may be giving up so much information and opening our minds in a way to change how we think about issues in the United States. Yeah. And, and Greg, you, well, you focus on this personal security stuff. I mean, uh, millions of Americans are all over all this social media stuff. Where are they at risk? What do you suggest in that area? Well, particularly against the Chinese, it's about awareness. I mean, the Chinese have been doing this for decades, and we are just now talking about it. Right. We really are getting serious for the first time, and it's been going on for decades. So I think the more we can have programs like this, they let people and the public aware that this is what they're doing, and these are mechanisms, mechanisms in which they're doing it, that in and of itself will help us become more, you know, more prepared to defend against it. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, as you said, they have been doing it for decades. Talk to us a little bit about the Confucius Institutes that China has backed. I'm not familiar with those enough to talk about that with your audience. They, they, your audience is too smart for me to... <laughs> but essentially what it is is that China has supported various institutes for Chinese culture. There used to be one... We, at have, the, one at, we have one at UTD. I think you had yeah. it. I'm not sure if you still have well, I'm, it. I'm not sure it's still supported by the same group. But That's one right. of the things that you're seeing is China is spending millions, if not billions of dollars on public diplomacy, soft power, which is something that the United States used to do a lot more effectively. Well, there's no question about that. and. Um, you know, I, I think I want to I want to go to hear what Ned Price said in a few minutes. But before I do, um, Greg, I want you to talk to that viewer about what he or she can do to sort of be in understanding their survival mode. What what do they need to be thinking about that they're not thinking about right now? Uh, wow, it's a loaded question. Um, really, two points: survival mindset and situational awareness. Um, you know, those are the first two chapters of my book. We have to develop in our kids and ourselves that survival mindset. And a good example of that is both the Pulse nightclub shooting and the Virginia Tech shooting, where virtually the individuals that were killed just waited for their turn to die. That when they walked into Virginia Tech, the shooter walked across the classroom, pulled his weapon out, and literally went up and down each aisle and shot every person in that particular classroom. And there was a young woman by the name of Christina Anderson who was in the fourth chair back in the row closest to the door, and had plenty of time to get up and run out the door, but instead she did everything, she did what everybody else did. She put her head on the chair and folded the desktop over top of her and quote, her words not mine, waited for my turn to die. Now she was shot three times in the back and survived, but what was her survival mindset? Why didn't she know enough to get up and run? And then there's situational awareness. Of course, awareness. that was one of the first shootings, mass shootings like that in that university. Correct. But the same thing happened with the individuals who ran into the restroom at the Pulse nightclub. Nine people ran into one restroom. He walks in, and instead of attacking him, they waited for the turn to die. Mm -hmm. Now, compare that with what happened on Flight 93 with Ted Beeman saying, let's roll. That's a great example of having that survival mindset that says, not today, we're not dying today, we're going to band together and take care of the situation. Mm -hmm. So, Well, you, you talk about situational awareness. So, 
We've done a lot of programs with veterans, and as we all know, some veterans come back from places Iraq, Afghanistan with PTSD, others with traumatic brain injuries, et cetera, and some of them have actually told us about um, they're not able to get out of their mind when they walk into any place, supermarket, anything else. They can't get this situational awareness out of their head, so we don't want to go there, right. but, but what, what do we want to do that can be done for that viewer? Yeah, you don't want to walk around in a paranoid state. Right. You're not looking around every corner under every bush for you know, a predator. That's not what I'm talking about. It's relaxed awareness. And here's the example I use for good situational awareness. The unfortunate incident in Nice, France on Bastille Day, July 14th, a few mm -hmm. years ago. This is a 19-ton truck traveling at 45 miles an hour for close to a mile. He runs over and kills 86 people and wounds 400. I'm thinking if I'm walking down that promenade, I'm gonna sense the fact that people are dying behind me as a 19-ton truck is barreling down at me at 45 miles an hour. I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but what was their situational awareness? How is it a truck can run over 86 people? We had a similar incident in New York City on Halloween two years ago mm -hmm. where a Home Depot truck ran over seven people. Now I understand killing seven with a vehicle, but 86 and injuring 400? I don't understand the, the dynamics uh, or the situational awareness blindness mm -hmm. that those individuals had. So right. what do you recommend to people when they go into a mall or to a restaurant? <clears throat> First thing they should do is think about an, an exit strategy? Look, for exit strategy, exactly. 76% of active shooters come to their front door. So if you're in a Walmart in El Paso and you hear what you think is gunfire, don't run out the front door, run out the back door. But we rationalize our fears away. When we hear gunfire, we think fireworks. We don't think gunfire because gunfire is scary. We rationalize our fears away as human beings. But have good situation awareness means knowing where the exits are. Looking for things that don't fit in the environment. Because a lot of times these killers will give indicators that they're up to no good before it happens. And you know, we were talking earlier about how China recruits. It's the same type of thing, situational awareness. If it, if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't smell right, somebody's, like in one case of an American who was recruited and then became a Chinese spy, uh, he was offered a free trip to China and it didn't re really quite make sense. He <laughs> wouldn't qualify for that job, but he thought, I'll go to China. And then yeah. look what happened. Yeah. So yeah. You know, it's really just always I mean, thinking ahead. The point we're saying here is it can happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and everything that used to be global is now local. Yeah. And um, if we give people that access um, and not listen to that little voice on the inside that says mm -hmm. something's not right, um, then the bad things begin to happen. There's uh, a great book by Gavin DeBecker called Gift of Fear. Mm -hmm. Speaks just about that. Listen to that inner voice, that gift of fear. It, it's based on external stimuli and it never lies to you. Mm -hmm. Jim, you inter interviewed another CIA guy named Ned Price, and we've got that video as well. Why don't you tell everybody who Ned Price is, and then uh, go ahead and run Yeah, that video. Uh, Ned is a CIA veteran, as you know. He worked in the uh, analytical division, mm -hmm. and then he went over and worked for in the President Obama administration in the National Security Council, and he's got a, a really interesting take on what we need to be, as you would say, wary of. There's been an interesting story that was in the Washington Post about a week ago about how China is using LinkedIn to recruit potential spies. They are, you know, they are using every tool uh, at their disposal. Uh, some tools that have been around for quite some time and some tools that are really uh, cutting edge. I think the Chinese uh, in some ways have leapfrogged us because uh, they have taken the best of our technological know-how and really uh, sucked it out of our own system and adapted it for their own use. You mentioned uh, LinkedIn as one tool. Of course, LinkedIn is a great asset for uh, for those seeking professional opportunities, but it's also a great asset for intelligence services around the world. And the Chinese have really, along with the Russians, I say, but the Chinese um, have really pioneered uh, the use of uh, LinkedIn and other social media uh, companies for the targeting of potential uh, intelligence recruits. I think uh, more than that, however, uh, the threat we're facing from China um, is one that is really accelerated and multiplied um, by their uh, theft, use of, and organic development of uh, technology, including artificial intelligence. Um, the Chinese have been pretty brazen, as we've heard, I think rightly, from President Trump 
uh, over the course of his presidency that uh, we have to do something about uh, the theft of intellectual property and especially uh, the theft of expertise and know-how when it comes to uh, matters of national security. The Chinese have outpaced us in this arena uh, for years now. Well, uh, Israel, the LinkedIn is obviously something every college student talks about. We've got to be on. We've got to do this. Everybody wants to be on Facebook. Everybody wants to be on all these other social media platforms. Um, we had a little dust up the last two or three years on something called Russia meddling in the 2016 election. I don't know if you heard that rumor or not, but it was... Um, we may have it in the 2020 election, <laughs> too. We so. may have it, too. But uh, give us some sense as a, as a sort of computer guru here about how all this stuff works and what we should be looking for. So um, I, I'll give you some breaking news. It's not uh, necessarily in the mainstream media. Is Much of what happened uh, during the first two quarters um, of the presidential election was wrong. And counterintelligence works that way. In other words, the, the first reports on what you think is happening um, have to be validated. And there were, it was interesting to me to see the momentum of conclusions, right? Uh, about politics, which nation state. Politics, perhaps? Yeah, it well, could be been. politics? Could have been. But so what happens is, is now the momentum gains strength and we have this herd mentality on jumping out what may be happening. And then the retractions don't get as much of the media, meaning, well, that was a mistake, it was not necessarily panda bear that was, or it was being used by someone else, et cetera. So I think there's two aspects to this. Was there intent? Um, sure, the Russians have been involved for many years. In fact, um, it was well known by the Obama administration um, that, that the Russians had intent back then and were attacking in different ways, okay? So that's not something new. But um, what is new is, is how brazen you're talking about the Chinese. We, we know today that there are foreign countries that have the type of malware that have triggers in them in our critical infrastructure. And recently was at a public meeting where uh, we had some senior people from Israel come over to say, we all know it's there, so why hasn't anyone pulled the trigger? That is, the trigger on the malware that would impact critical infrastructure in a material way that's negative, right, mm -hmm. in terms of operations. Water and electricity is? is? Hopefully because we have the same. It's, it's one of two things. We don't know. It's an opinion. One is, first of all, everyone said we don't know why. Okay? Um, but in my opinion, it's even a parasite does not kill its host. So there are many in, in very senior positions in the cyber world that say, look, Chinese already have everything they want. They just want to get more. And, and, and much of that, the evidence is true because we have multi-level threats going back to the graphic. You have people, you have networks, you have telecommunications, uh, the fiber optics, are, even the cables that are across the ocean that run all of the data, right? Are, many of those are at some level owned by Chinese companies that are part of the Communist Party, if you follow the, the, the food chain going back into who owns what. So, so you look at that and you can almost throw up your arms and say, well, it's, it's too late. But it doesn't mean we, we stop the current momentum in terms of policy, uh, implementation of technology, and finding the insider threats, the human component, are really important uh, aspects of it. So we have a very complex situation. And recently, it was at a, a meeting uh, where Dr. Ray, public meeting again, where he was saying that not only FBI, but corporate America, this was a board member's meeting, needs to understand this complex threat. It's multi-layered. And we have to unwind kind of the brain surgery, the chess that they're playing in terms of integrating into our society, funding the ideology, funding policy to be in a certain direction, right? And uh, as well as buying those companies that are part of our core critical infrastructure in terms of how we communicate. And we've allowed this to happen over time due to policy, right? It's been happening for years, but now we're recognizing that the intellectual property theft is so obscene, right? And it's hurting our economy in a material way. So, so we have to address this personally, you know, at home, encrypting our drives and doing things like that, being aware of how the messaging is impacting our minds in terms of um, changing society, right? And then the other is our policymakers and holding them accountable in a way that says, we, we cannot continue to operate this way. Cybersecurity under the current level of policies, and, and many think that 
that if you were to be compliant, then you wouldn't be compromised, and that is just not true. Not true. Cybersecurity yeah. in the current environment is no longer sustainable. Well, that's out there, yeah. you say, in, in all the infrastructure. <clears throat> yeah. But I mean, all these uh, big institutions, banks, is et cetera, get attacked what thousands, millions of times a day. Would right. that be fair yeah. to say? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me ask you cases. before we go, how is it that the United States, if this is accurate, fell so far behind with 5G or, or even quantum computing? Because I hear that the Chinese are ahead of us there. Well, because our, our competitors internationally stole where we were in our current state, you know, even 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, so they didn't have to invest all that time, energy, and money to understand the newer technology. So they skipped an entire generation of investment and time. And once you steal that and you apply national resources, right, and large numbers and dollars, not only to the government side in China or in Russia, but also into the private sector, then you, you, you tend to leapfrog, right? And we just haven't had that focus in the United States. You know, when we decided one, at one time in the past, we we're gonna go to the moon, right? So I think now the, the thinking has changed. Uh, at least I've seen in Washington, D.C., to say, okay, how do we now take 5G and quantum computing and get ahead of the competition because we're not right now. Here's the other aspect, one quick thing. 70%, Department of Defense says 70% of their data is in the private sector, and private sector is not aware of how to deal with things other than cyber crime rather than cyber warfare. Exactly. We have 15 seconds left. You have the last 15 seconds, Greg. To show the divide where we are right now against China, we have a leading Democratic presidential candidate who is quoted as saying, China is not the enemy. Really? Interesting. Well, and we could argue about whether President Trump is going about it the right way. That's another, he's, going, he's going about, he's facing up to China, whether it's the right way with tariffs or what, that's another argument for another program. Jim, thank you for being here. Israel, thank, thank you, you Greg, thank you so much thank for being you. here. You know, and thanks you for joining us to discuss this difficult and scary subject. And we hope you now have some tools to avoid risk. Join us on Twitter, check mcquistiontv.com for additional information on this subject. And keep joining us as we talk about things that matter with people who care. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email nickyn at nickymcquistion.com. Visit our website at www.mcquistiontv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash mcquistiontv or download McQuistion TV video podcast on iTunes. Music